Welcome to the Chief Architect Bootcamp webinar. My name is Carrie, and I'd like to thank you for taking the time to attend this class and to learn more about Chief Architect. If you already own a copy of our software, feel free to follow along with me during the class. If you don't have a copy of Chief Architect, you can download a free trial version from our website at chiefarchitect.com. This class is designed for people who are new to Chief Architect and not sure where to get started. We're going to start at the very beginning, creating a new plan. We'll include drawing out walls, creating multiple floors, generating different roof styles, as well as placing cabinets and other objects into the plan. We'll then wrap up with sending views to our layout for printing. When you've finished watching this class, you should have a good idea on how to use Chief Architect to create your own designs. Let's go ahead and get started. When you first open Chief Architect, you'll be presented with the Startup Options screen. This is where you can choose to start a new plan, a new layout, create one from a template, open an existing plan or layout. Also, we have these Getting Started resources available for you on our website. I'll go ahead and click on New Plan. The very first time you launch Chief Architect and click on New Plan, you'll get this New Plans and Layouts dialog. This allows you to choose uh, whether or not you're using a U.S. unit, like inches, or metric units, millimeters. I'll choose U.S. units. You can also choose whether or not you're working in a residential template or an interiors template. The residential template has default setters set up to have dimensions locating framing, uh, whereas interiors template will have dimensions locating the surface of the walls, like your drywall. I'll choose the residential template for this class, and then I'll click OK. When you first install Chief Architect, it'll need to download the core catalogs. This is going to be anything that we add to our plan, so this could include some materials, furniture, objects, and all the things that you can add to your project are in those core catalogs. I've already downloaded them to this computer, so I'm going to say no, but if this is the first time you're launching Chief Architect, uh, please say yes. Now that we've opened a new plan, let's discuss the user interface. At the very top of the screen, you'll find the menus. This is where you're going to find the majority of the tools within Chief Architect. Below that, we have our toolbars. The toolbars are more efficient ways of accessing the tools that are in those menus. Along the left-hand side, we have our tool palette. Chief Architect has a parent-child relationship with our tools. So these toolbars up here, each one that has this little black triangle is a parent tool. And that black triangle indicates that we have child tools available. So if I click on this wall tool, this is a my wall parent, and our child tools are exterior walls, interior walls, foundation walls, etc. So each one of these parent tools has a list of these child tools. Over on the right hand side of the screen, we have our side windows. We have the library browser, the project browser, and the active layer display options. The library browser is where you can find a lot of content to add to your plan. The project browser is going to be how you can organize the different views within your file. So for example, we have our untitled plan here because we haven't saved yet, but when we create CAD details or saved cameras or cross sections, we can find all of those saved views in here. Next, we have our active layer display options. Every item within your project is assigned a layer, and you can specify the display of that layer on or off using this active layer display options. Now, if you're working on a smaller screen, you can toggle these side windows off using these tool buttons over on the right-hand side here. So this is my toggle for my project browser, library browser, and active layer display options. Down the right-hand side, we have a few more. We have our zoom tools. These allow us to zoom in and out of the plan if we don't want to do it through our scroll wheel on our mouse. We also have a toggle for our crosshair. So if you see my cursor in the middle of the screen there, you can see that blue crosshair. I'll turn it off just because it's a little bit distracting. We can choose to change our color on and off, show line weights, a variety of other ones. And towards the bottom here, you're going to find our reference grid. So you can see these blue grid lines here. If we don't want to see that, we can just toggle that off. When we first start a plan, we are typically drawing walls. So let's go up to our wall tool parent, and we can see our straight exterior wall. This is what I'll start with. When I select that tool, I can click and drag to draw my wall. And you'll notice that as I was drawing, we get a temporary dimension. So that's a good way to quickly eyeball you know, how long that wall is. If I select this wall, we can get some edit handles. So we have these squares on either end that allow us to lengthen or shorten our wall. 
we have the red handle in the middle. This is our move handle. It allows us to move the wall. And then we have these little diamonds on the ends. These are same wall type extension handles. So if I click on this, I can extend this wall. And then we have a triangle floating off to the side here. And this is our rotation handle, so I can rotate that wall. Now let's investigate what this wall is. Once you have a wall selected, in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, we have our edit toolbar. Now this edit toolbar allows us to modify the selected object in some way. And in this instance, we have our wall, so it gives us tools that can modify a wall. We're going to click on the Open Object Edit Tool. Now, if you like hotkeys, you can see that we have Control e as a hotkey for this particular uh, function. If you're on a Mac, that'll be Command-E. But I'll click on that open door to open the object, and this will open up the specification dialog for the wall. Now, every object is going to have a specification dialog with different settings that are available for us. In this instance, I'm going to go to the wall types panel so we can see what wall type this wall is using. So we can see this is a siding six wall. And what it means to be a siding six wall, we can find out by clicking on this define button. Each wall type has a series of layers. So we have our exterior layers, our main layer, and we have our interior layers. So the exterior layer, this is our siding, house wrap, OSB. And then the main layer is going to be our structural layer. This is our fur framing. And then the interior layer is the interior finishes. So this is drywall. I'll leave it how it is for now, but I'll go ahead and hit cancel here. I'll cancel out of this one. And let's go ahead and delete these walls. So I can group select by clicking on one, holding down the shift key on my keyboard, and clicking on the others. And that'll do a group select, and then I can press the delete key on my keyboard to delete those. Or we can go to our select objects tool. The select objects tool is a very versatile tool that allows you to select any object. And if we click and drag a marquee over our walls here, we can group select them together and then press the delete key on our keyboard to get rid of them. Now, when we have our exterior wall tool, we can control what type of wall is going to be drawn with that tool by modifying our defaults. So if I double click on the straight exterior wall tool, it'll open up our exterior wall defaults. We can go back to our wall types and we could change this to a stucco or to a brick. Or in this project, we're actually going to use pony walls for our exterior walls. We'll have a stone facade down in the bottom half of our wall here. So we have brick six is what's currently selected. If I click the define button for that, you can see that the layers of this wall, we have a dark red brick, an air gap, house wrap OSB for framing and drywall. I'm not going to use the red brick, instead I'm going to use a kind of a stacked stone. So to change this material, I can double click on the material name here, and it'll open up our library browser. So this is our select material dialog, it has our library browser items here. And in our masonry and stone, so this is in the core catalogs materials, masonry and stone, we're going to find this stacked stone material here. I'll click OK. Now, once that it's here, we can actually open up the textures. This is opening up the select material once again, but we'll go to our plan materials. Our stack stone is selected, and we're going to edit this. I want to change this material from a brown to more of a gray. So on my pattern panel here, I can choose a base color. This is going to be what shows up in our cross sections. And I'm going to change this just to a gray. But then I'm going to go over to our texture panel, and we're going to blend that gray with our stack stone. And so now we have a gray stack stone, and I'll click OK, and OK, and OK. So now we have a gray stack stone on the bottom half of our wall, and the next thing that we're going to modify is going to be the elevation of that lower wall. So I'm going to set this to 36 inches off for the lower wall top here. We also have the height off floor. Modifying either one of these values will be fine. All right, so this is in my exterior wall defaults, so I'll go ahead and click OK. And now when I grab my exterior wall and I click and drag and draw my wall out, if I open that wall again, we can see that that wall is now drawing our stone facade on the lower half of our wall here. All right, so let's go ahead and delete that. So let's go ahead and get started drawing our project. So I have my straight exterior wall tool. I'm going to click and drag 
to draw out my shape. Now you'll notice I'm not paying overly much attention to the actual dimensions of these walls. I'm just quickly filling in our shape. And then once we have an enclosed space, you can see that we have a roof generated and we have some dimensions generated. Just to reiterate that, if this wasn't a closed shape, we just have walls. But as soon as we close it up, the program is able to determine what is inside the structure and what is outside the structure, so we actually have what we call room definition. So if I hit my spacebar on my keyboard, it will activate my Select Objects tool. And if I click in the middle here, it'll highlight that middle room. And that is how we determine, you know, how we are able to see that room definition. If you ever click in the middle of a room and you don't get a highlight like this, it means that it's not fully enclosed. So keep that in mind. If you're not able to select a room, you'll want to look at how those walls are connected to make sure that we have an enclosed shape. All right, so now that we have an enclosed shape and we have our dimensions, uh, let's go ahead and get our dimensions set to the ones that we actually want. Now to dimension walls, you know, we have these automatic dimensions already here. We can select a wall and we get some temporary dimensions as well. But we have the ability to lengthen the wall using either the perpendicular dimension, which dimensions the space between two walls, or the dimension that goes the length of the wall. Either one is fine, and you can determine which dimensions can modify this wall by how your cursor interacts with them. So for example, when I mouse over this dimension, I get a pointing hand cursor. If I mouse over this dimension, my cursor stays as a arrow. So whenever you see that pointing hand, that tells us that we can modify that dimension, and that dimension will modify the selected wall in some fashion. So if I click on this dimension here, this dimension is parallel to the wall that I have selected, and I can type in the exact dimensions that I want this wall to be. So in this instance, I'm going to do 42 feet. Now, you'll want to pay attention to these extra three buttons here. Whenever you select a dimension that is parallel to the wall that you have selected, you're going to see these extra buttons. And this is going to tell you how that wall is going to move when we apply this new dimension. So in this instance, this right-hand tool is selected, and that means that this left-hand side is going to stay stationary, and the right end is going to move. So this left side of the wall is not going to move, but this right side will when we have this tool button selected. All right, so we have 42 feet here. I'm going to press the Enter key on my keyboard. And you'll notice that that right-hand side moved while the left-hand side stayed stationary. Now let's take a look at the dimension going across the room. So I have this same wall selected. I'll click on this dimension here. And you'll notice that we only have two buttons. We have Move Both Ends and Move Object. Now, whenever you're working with the distance in between two walls, these buttons don't really matter so much. However, when you're working with the dimension that is parallel to the wall, you really have to pay attention to these dimensions. All right, so I have this wall selected. I'm going to grab this dimension, which is going across the room. And this dimension is going to be 28 feet. Now, the wall that I have selected is the wall that's going to move. None of these other walls will move. All right, so I have 28 feet in there. I'm going to press the Enter key on my keyboard. And the wall that was selected is the wall that moved. And that's going to be true for any object that you're wanting to move using dimensions. You select the object that's going to move, and then you click on the dimension in order to move it. All right, so we only have two dimensions specified, so let's go ahead and finish up the other dimensions here. Now, this is the wall that we've been modifying so far, so I want to be careful as I'm going through my other dimensions that I'm not going to undo that 42-foot dimension that we've already specified. So this right-hand side here, this is going to actually need to be 38 foot 4 instead of the 33 foot 9. So in order to change this, we don't want to move this wall because we already have this 28-foot dimension specified as well. So we want to be careful not to move this wall or any wall that's connected to this particular dimension or this dimension here. So if we don't want to move this wall and we need this to be a 38 instead of a 33, we can either select this wall, click on this dimension, and make sure the bottom edge is moving and not the top because we don't want the top to move. Or we can click on this bottom wall here and then click on this dimension and type our new 38 foot 4 dimension here. This is the wall that's selected, so this will be the wall that moves. All right, so we'll go ahead and type in 38 foot 4, 
and press enter. This wall was selected, so it was the one that moved. All of my connections are there. So we have this bottom one next. So I can click on this left-hand wall, use the dimension that goes across the room, type in 13 foot 4 here, or selecting the same wall, I can use this, or if I select this wall, I can use this as well. Just make sure that we know what side of that wall is going to move. 13 foot 4, enter. This left-hand side was selected. All right. So now we have our basic shell created, and we're going to move on to creating some interior walls. However, these roof planes might get in the way while we're working, so we're going to go ahead and turn off the roof planes layer. To do that, we're going to go to our active layer display options. Each object in Chief Architect is assigned a layer. So in our active layer display options, we have a name filter. In that, we can type in the word roof, and it will filter to all of the roof plane layers. The roof planes are on the roof plane layer, so if I wanted to hide that, I just remove this check mark from the display column. Now, one thing that I'll like to point out right now is that we are in the working layer set. When we start sending views to our layout and we're working on other parts of our plan, we're going to be paying attention to those layer sets and saved plan views. But right now we're in our working plan view. This is where we can turn layers on and off and not have to worry about affecting other views. So I'm going to turn off my roof planes layer so that these lines get out of our way and we can start working on those interior walls. To draw interior walls, we'll use our straight interior wall tool. So this is in our wall tool parent straight interior wall. And we'll just click and drag across and we'll create an interior wall here. I'll go back to my select objects arrow and you can see that we have two different rooms in here now. Let's go ahead and divide up our space. So I'll grab my interior wall tool again and I'm just going to roughly put some walls in here for our design. All right, so we have some walls in. I'll go back to my select objects arrow and now we have each space kind of a, its own little room. We can move these interior walls using the dimensions that we already have. We can also throw in some interior dimensions for ourselves as well. So let's go ahead and use the dimensions that we already have for right now. All right, so we'll select the, the wall we want to move, and then we'll click on the dimension that we want to use to move it. All right, so this dimension here is going to be 13 feet. I'll press Enter. Notice that the wall that we had selected is the wall that moved. I'll do the same thing on this side here. Now this wall, notice it goes all the way across, and the walls that we went across it broke into different pieces. So that's going to govern how these walls are going to move as well. So this wall here is going to be 11 foot 5. All right. And then we're also going to have our garage have 2 by 6 walls instead of the 2 by 4 walls that we have for our interior walls. So I'm just going to stretch this wall up. And I'm just going to grab the same wall extension handle and go across here as well. You'll notice that it brought my exterior walls inside. So we're going to need to change these wall types to be an interior type wall type, but I'm going to have fire rated drywall on the garage side, and we definitely don't want our pony wall on the inside here. So we're going to grab this wall and we're going to break it into two sections. So we'll use this break wall tool and we'll break it here. And then we'll group select these two walls. So I have this wall selected. I'll hold down the shift key on my keyboard and we'll click on this wall here. Now, once we have the group selection, we're going to click on open object. So that's that little blue open door in the bottom left hand corner of the screen again. This will open up our specification. And we can see our pony wall with our stack stone down here. We're going to go to our wall types panel. We will uncheck pony wall so that we get rid of that. And then in our drop down for wall type, we're going to choose our fire six wall type. So this is the, the wall that has drywall on both sides. And one side has a fire rated drywall. All right, so I'll click OK on that. Now, if I zoom in close on this, we can see our fire rated drywall here. And that fire rated drywall needs to be facing inward. Let's get this up. So we'll grab this wall, and on our toolbar at the bottom of the screen, we have a reverse wall layers tool button. When we click on that, it'll bring that fire rated drywall to the inside. So I'll click on this wall. 
reverse wall layers, and it swaps that regular drywall and the fire rated drywall layers. All right, so that is done. I'll double click in this room here and open up the room specification, and we'll call this a garage. And then let's go ahead and rename these other rooms as well. So this room is going to be our bedroom. This will be our dining room. Kitchen. Now these room types are capable of doing more than just labeling the room. For example, when we changed this to a garage, it gave us a 4-inch slab, whereas our kitchen still has a regular floor structure here. In our defaults, so if we go to the white wrench at the top of the screen here, our default settings, if we go into floors and rooms and we look at room types, we can specify different room types. And if we grab our bathroom, for example, and we click Edit, we can specify some of the settings for that bath, including uh, floor finishes and ceiling finishes, if we know that every bath that we do is going to have tile, for example. Let's talk some more about dimensions. So on our toolbar at the top, we have our dimension tools. So let's grab our yellow ruler here. This is our dimension tool parent. We have manual dimensions, end-to-end -end dimensions, and interior dimensions. Right now, we're going to use the interior dimension tool. So our interior dimension tool allows us to dimension rooms, and it'll locate both sides of our interior walls here. So you'll notice that our exterior dimensions are just grabbing one side of those exterior walls. We're going to use our interior dimensions inside. So I'm going to click and drag a line across all of these rooms here, and you can see that our dimensions are locating either side of those walls. If I zoom in real close, you can see that these arrows are locating the framing layer of the wall. That's because we are in the residential template, if you remember. If you're in the interiors template, that kitchen and bath template, it's going to locate the surfaces of the walls instead of the framing of the walls. Let's draw in a few more walls here. Grab my straight interior wall tool. I'm going to put a bathroom and a closet in this bedroom. And let's go ahead and turn off our room labels just so they're out of our way. So once again, these are just layers. So I'll hit my space bar to let go of my wall tool. This takes me back to my select objects tool. Select my room label, and you'll notice that my active layer display options automatically filtered based upon the object that I had selected. So in this instance, I have room label. I'm going to turn off the display of room labels so that we can see our spaces a little bit easier here. All right, so we'll grab our dimension tools again. Let's grab that interior dimension tool. And I'm just going to draw a line across here, and then I'm going to do a line down this way as well. Hit my space bar to let go of my dimension tool. And let's look at these spaces here. So I'll click on this wall here. And I'm just going to turn off my temporary dimensions because we're getting a bit much. So temporary dimensions display whenever you select an object, it'll give you dimensions to related objects. However, since we're drawing our own dimensions, our temporary dimensions are just kind of getting in the way. So to toggle those off, over on the right-hand side of the screen, we have a double arrow with a T. This is our temporary dimensions toggle. So we can turn those on and off at will as we need them. All right, so I'll click on this wall and click on this dimension. This is going to be a 21 foot 7. So this is the wall that I have selected. So it's going to be the one that moves. So I'll do 21 foot 7 and press Enter. All right, and then we'll grab this wall. This is going to be 5 foot 1. All right, now we'll go on this wall here. You'll notice that we have two sets of dimensions here. So this is going to be one thing that's going to affect us. So we've already set this dimension, so I don't want to just move this wall. But what I want to do is break this wall into multiple segments so that I can move a portion of it without moving the other part. So on my toolbar at the bottom of the screen, we have a break tool. So it's called Add Break. If I click on that, and then I click where I need that break, I now have this piece that I can then align with this wall here. Now we have our, temper our interior dimension here. If we don't want it to locate this intersection, you just grab the diamond and throw it off the dimension line. Alright, so I'll click on this wall here, 
So this here we have 9 foot 6 and 13 16. So I'm going to go ahead and just round this up to a 9 foot 7. But notice I forgot to hit this dimension here first. So I don't want to move my outside wall because I've already dimensioned this. So I'm going to grab this wall instead. This is just going to be a 5 foot closet here. And then I'll grab this. This will go back to our 9 foot 7. And there we go. Alright, so we have this piece here. Now we want to be able to move this without moving this, so we're going to do another break right at this intersection. Let's move it up here for right now. And this is going to be one where we want to divide it to have two different spaces, but we also don't want to see that wall. It's going to be invisible. So on our edit toolbar at the bottom of the screen we have a make walls invisible tool. So I'll click on that. So now we have a dashed line here instead of our solid wall, so we can actually see through this space but still have it defined separately. I'm going to make a closet here for our entryway, and then we'll have a doorway going into the garage here. So once again, we'll grab this wall, use our break tool, we'll break it at either side, select this piece in the middle, and delete it. Alright, so now that we have our first floor in a working order, let's go ahead and build a foundation. So to do that, we're going to go to either our build menu, and you'll find floor and build foundation. Or on your toolbar, we have this two-story house here. We'll click on floor tools parent. We'll find our build foundation tool. This will open up our build foundation dialog, and we get to choose how we want this foundation to generate. So if we choose our automatically rebuild foundation, it means that as we make any changes to our first floor, our foundation will follow along with it. So we'll start with that turned on. All right, next we can choose walls with footing, grade beam on piers, or monolithic slab. We're going to choose walls with footings. We have a 4-inch slab, and then our stem walls here, minimum height. So this is going to be how deep we want our foundation to go at a minimum. So if we want to have a full basement, we're going to do, uh, let's do 101 and an eighth. Notice that this does include the one and a half inch sill plate. It's going to use our default foundation wall, which is an eight inch concrete stem wall, and I think that'll be fine. And this allows us to control how the floor of our garage is going to behave. Garage floor to stem wall top has 12 inches. This means that the garage floor will be 12 inches lower than the top of the stem wall. Minimum garage height is how deep that stem wall is going to go, and we'll leave it at 24 inches for this project. I'll click OK, and now it's moved us to our foundation level. Now we can tell we're on the foundation level, one, because we can see the concrete walls, but two, because our floor control at the top of the screen here says zero. Now if I hit the arrow up, we'll go back to the first floor. If we hit the arrow down, it'll take us back down to the basement. All right, so we can see that we already have a step from the garage to the main house here. Now this is a pretty big span, so we'll need to put in a bearing wall. And to do that, we can either draw it manually here, or since we have the auto rebuild foundation on, we can just specify some bearing walls on the upper level to have it generate a wall and footing underneath it for us. So let's go back up to the first floor. Let's grab this wall. We'll open object. And we're going to go to the structure panel. And on the structure panel, we can choose to have this set as a bearing wall. And what that's going to do, it's going to create a wall and footing below. And when we generate framing, it's going to actually allow our joist to bear on this wall for us. So I'll choose bearing wall, and then I'll click OK. And then we'll go down to the foundation level, and you can see that it created a foundation wall for us here. Now, if we didn't have that auto rebuild foundation turned on, this wall would not automatically generate. All right, so if we want to be able to see the walls of the first floor while we are looking at the basement level, we can turn on our reference display. So we can find our reference display by going to Tools, Floor, Reference Display, and then Reference Display here. Or over on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll find the Reference Display tool on the right-hand side toolbar. All right, so you can see that all these red lines are the walls that are located on the first floor. And we can see that our 
concrete foundation wall here is directly underneath that wall on the first floor. Now, if we wanted to create part of this as a full basement and part of this as a crawl space, we have two separate rooms here, or three separate rooms with the garage slab here. So if I select one of these rooms and I open object, on the structure panel, we can see where the ceiling elevation is, where the floor elevation is, as well as the stem wall height and the finishes. So if we wanted to create this area as a crawl space instead of a full basement, what we can do is we can change our stem wall height to 36 inches. You'll notice that manually changing this value is going to change a room on the foundation level. And with auto rebuild foundation turned on, our changes will be lost. So in order for this to take effect, we'll have to turn off the auto rebuild foundation. So I'll go ahead and say yes. That turns that off. And then we're going to uncheck floor under this room so that we don't have a slab in our crawl space. And we don't want a drywall finish in our crawl space either. So we'll look at our ceiling finish. We'll edit that. And we can just delete these layers so that we don't have any finishes in our crawl space. All right, that's all I'm going to do. So I'll click OK. You can see our step marker there. And if we go into our camera tools, which is this guy here, go into a perspective floor overview, we can see our full basement, our garage lab, and our crawl space. If we go up a level, we can see all of the rooms on our first floor. And since we specified this room as a garage, it has our concrete slab. And you can see our gray stacked stone pony wall. All right, I'll go ahead and close out of that camera view. And let's go up and build our second floor. So I'll use our floor controls here to go up. Here's our first floor. The next level up is our attic level, and we don't have anything up there. So let's go back down to our first floor. So we're going to go back to our floor controls here, and we can choose build new floor. Derive the new second floor plan from the first floor plan. What this means is that it's going to create a second floor with the same exterior walls in the same location as the first floor. And generally, that's going to be the more efficient route rather than making a new blank floor plan for the second floor because it'll already have those exterior walls set up and aligned for us. So I'll go ahead and click OK. Now here we get to specify our floor to default. Mainly, our, we're going to be taking a look at that ceiling height. We have our absolute elevations and we have our relative heights. Now on the first floor, the absolute elevations and the relative heights are going to be pretty much the same. However, on the second floor, the absolute elevations are going to go from zero, which if you notice in the diagram is going to be on the floor below. So this is our first floor. The subfloor is zero. So that's why our absolute elevations are quite a bit higher than what you might expect. Our relative heights, though, are going to be relative to the floor that we're on. So we can see that we're at 97 and an eighth with a finished ceiling of 95 and 5 eighths. And that's going to work just fine for what we're going to do today. But if you're doing an as-built condition, you might be working in that finished ceiling if that's the only value that you know. All right, so I'll go ahead and click OK. And now we have our second floor and we are referencing the walls on our first floor, and we can toggle those on and off using that reference display that we talked about. All right, so let's draw an interior wall up here. So we'll go back to our wall tools, and we'll grab our straight interior wall. I'm gonna click and drag and draw a wall here. And you'll notice that we kind of get a teal color along the edges of our walls, and that tells me that this wall is exactly aligned with the wall that's below it. Now, if I move this slightly out of the way, you can see our red lines here. Now, if you're trying to align walls between floors, the reference display is a great way to do that. Also, when you have a wall selected, if it's really close to being aligned with the wall below it or above it, you're going to see this tool on our edit toolbar. It's called align with wall below, or you might see align with wall above. If you ever see that button, it means that the wall that you have selected could possibly be aligned with the wall above it or below it. So I'll go ahead and click on this, and it's going to move that wall into position. If it's already aligned, you won't see that tool. If it's too far out of alignment, you won't see that tool. But if they overlap at all, you're going to see that align with wall above or align with wall below. All right, so let's zoom out and draw some stairs. 
So we're zoomed in pretty close here. Over on the right hand side we have our zoom tools. So we have fill window with selected objects, fill window building only, and then we have fill window. So I'm going to click on fill window. It'll zoom us out until it includes everything that we have in our scene here on floor two. If we choose building only, it'll zoom us in to where we're outside of the walls. All right, so let's go back down to floor one and we're going to create our set of stairs. And just to clean some things up for us, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the display of dimensions for a little while. So I'll grab my select objects tool, click on a dimension and turn off the display of those dimensions. All right, we're going to turn off our reference display for now as well. So we'll toggle that off. So now that we see just our floor plan view. Now on our toolbar at the top, you'll find our stair tool parent and we have draw stairs. We have straight stairs, curved stairs, L and U-shaped stairs, ramps and landings. Let's start with creating a U-shaped stair. When you click on the U-shaped stair tool, you'll see an option for clockwise or counterclockwise and winders. And then we also have settings specifically for U-shaped stairs for a gap. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and choose clockwise, so it'll go in a clockwise direction. And we'll do a gap of three inches just so that we can maybe put a wall or a divider in between. I'll click OK and you can see that we now have a U-shaped set of stairs following my cursor. So this is just some feedback for us. Now you'll notice it's going in a clockwise direction right now. We aren't bumped up against any walls. However, when we do bump up against walls, we can choose the direction that those go up regardless of what setting we chose in that dialog. So if we wanted it to go up from one side versus another, we just move our cursor around. I'm not clicking and dragging, I'm just moving my cursor around. Once you have it in the right location, you can just click and have it place. I'm going to click undo, and let's take a look at the L-shaped stair. We get that same dialog. We can ignore our U-shaped stair settings. We can choose clockwise or counterclockwise. So I'll leave it at clockwise again. I'll click OK, and you can see that we have an L-shaped set of stairs. And when we're not bumped up against a wall, it's going to go in a clockwise direction. If we bump up against a wall, we can choose what direction we want it to go, regardless of the setting, just like the Use Shape Stairs tool. Once you have it where you like, you just click to place it. I'm going to undo that, and we can show you some of those other tools. Straight set of stairs, same sort of thing. We don't have any clockwise or counterclockwise, but as you bump up against walls, it's going to change some directions. Most of the time I'm using the draw stairs tool, but it kind of depends on how much control you want to have over it, you know, right away. So for draw stairs, you actually click and drag your set of stairs to create your staircase. Now with all of these stair tools, you're able to use the edit handles to click and drag to lengthen or shorten. For this project, we are going to put in about a four foot gap here. So we'll use our dimension tool one more time. And this time I'm going to use my end-to-end -end dimension tool. I'll click and drag. And it says your dimensions is turned off. Do you want to turn on that layer? I'll say yes. It'll turn on all my other dimensions, and that's okay. All right, let's take a look at the 6 foot 5 dimension that we have. You'll notice it's going to the outside of my wall. I'm going to click on that dimension, and we're going to use the diamond edit handle that's at the end of the arrow. And we're just going to pull it back to locate the inside of the framing for this dimension here. I'll click on my set of stairs here. So go to my select objects, click on my stairs, click on this dimension. And this is one of the ones where you want to look at that. So this is going to be moving my whole set of stairs and I'm okay with that. And we're going to do four feet. Now the stairs is what I had selected. So the stairs is what moved. If I had done the same operation with the wall selected, the wall would have moved instead. All right, so let's take a look at this set of stairs. If we double click on it, or if we click on that uh, open object tool button, we'll get the stair specification dialog. Now in here we can see that we have a steep staircase reaches next level. And it says it's steep because it thinks that the riser height might be a little bit taller than what you might expect. If we click on the make best fit, it's going to lengthen or shorten the staircase in order to get a riser height that's closer to seven inches. Now if we do that, we want to make sure that any side that we have precisely placed doesn't move. So this is where the lock top and lock bottom comes into play. So if I lock the bottom, the bottom of the stairs, this bottom 
part of the stair isn't going to move and any adjustments are going to be made on the upper part. So I'll click on Make Best Fit. And the bottom stayed in one location. The Make Best Fit reached out that top portion of the stairs so that it would reach the next level. And we have a riser height that's a little bit more manageable. All right, so I'll click OK there. Now, when you draw stairs with the, the Draw Stair tool, when you left click and drag, it's always going to go up from where you drag. So we're on the first floor, and the stairs are going up to the second floor. If we wanted to have a set of stairs in the basement going up, then we'd actually need to go down to the basement level, go to the Stair tool, and draw up. So we have our set of stairs. If we take a look inside, so I'm going to grab my camera tool here, and we'll use a full camera. If we click and drag, where you click is going to be where the cameraman's going to stand, and you drag in the direction that you want him to look. And we'll take a look at that set of stairs. And you can see as the stairs go up, we don't have a hole in that ceiling platform in order for us to walk through. So to create that stairwell up there, we can do a couple of different things. I'll go back to my plan view, grab my Select Objects tool, click on the staircase, and then we have this tool down here. This is the Auto Stairwell tool. The Auto Stairwell tool will automatically create a hole in the platform up above with railings around it so that we can walk up the stairs. So I'll go ahead and click on that. You'll notice that once I click on it, that tool goes away. I'll switch back to my camera, and you can see that we now have that opening in the floor platform so we can go upstairs. If I go up to the second level here, we can see that we have a set of railings that go around that opening. So I'll go ahead and come back to my plan view. We'll go up to the second floor in plan view, and you can see that we have this room here. And if we open up the room specification, you can see that it is an open below room that has been named stairwell. All right, I'll hit cancel on that. Stairwells are just rooms, as you saw. We can create manual stairwells as well, simply by grabbing our railing tools. So if we needed a, a shape that's different than our set of stairs, we can just draw in a room with railings, open it up, and specify it as an open below room. It's a, a great use for lofts as well. Now, the auto stairwell can also be manually modified, so if you needed this to be a bigger opening, you can just grab those railings and move them. Let's go back down to our first floor. And if we select our staircase and open up that specification, let's uh, briefly touch on some of the things that you can change in here. We have the total length, we have the width, we have tread depth, number of treads, bottom height, top height, and riser height. And these ones are grayed out because we have automatic treads and automatic heights turned on. If you want to manually modify those, we can lock the tread depth in order to specify the number of treads and the depth, or we can uncheck automatic heights and control those values here. We also have the ability to modify the style of the tread overhangs, the winders and things of that nature, the number of stringers that we have, the brake line and plan view, railings, newels and balusters, all in here. All right, let's add some doors and windows. So I will fill window again so that we can see our project. And up on our toolbar, we have our door tools. So we have our hinge door, which is probably the most prolific door that you'll find. If we click on the hinge door tool, we can move our cursor around and we can place doors. Now you'll notice as we move that cursor, the door might switch from one side to the other based upon where that cursor is. Also, if you click and you hold down that button, you can choose whether or not it's opening from the left, the right, inside or outside. So as you're holding that mouse button down, once you have the door where you want it, you release the cursor at that point, and then you don't have to modify the door again after that. However, if you have a door placed and you decide that you need to swap that opening, click on the door once so we have it selected. And on the Edit toolbar at the bottom of the screen, we have our Change Opening side, and then we have our Change Swing side. And those are just toggles that allow you to open in and out, left and right. All right, so I'll go ahead and place some more doors in here. If you grab your door and you make it wider, it'll automatically switch to a double door. If you select it and open it up, you can specify an exact width for it if you'd like. On the Options panel, 
you can choose whether or not it's a double door only or only a single door, or you can calculate from width, which is the, the default there for you. Back on the general panel, we can specify what door style we have. So right now it's use default. So we have an exterior door style here. Let's go ahead and change it to a glass panel door so that we can have some French style doors. We'll go to the lights panel and I'll just add a couple of lights here. Okay. Now I can center this door on the room. So I have the door selected. On my edit toolbar, I have a center object tool. So I'll click on that. And as I'm moving my cursor around, I have a center line. So if I want to center this door in the room, I move my cursor over the room and I make sure that that center line is going up and down to center that door in the wall. So we'll go to our window tools. We have our window. All right. And then let's go ahead and place a window. We'll put one here. I'll select it and open it up. You can see this is a double hung window. We can choose different window styles here. We can change the width. So let's go ahead and change this to 30 inches wide by 60 inches tall. We have our floor to top and floor to bottom values here. We can add lights and muntins if we wanted to, but we'll leave it as it is for now. If you do make a bunch of changes to a window and you want to use that window throughout your project, have the window selected, and on your edit toolbar you have a set as default button. So we can click on that, and we can see that our window defaults have been updated. And I'll click OK. So any new window that we place is going to have those same defaults. All right, so I'm just going to place some more windows throughout our project here. Let's work on creating a porch and a deck next. So we're going to go ahead and delete these dimensions so that we can clean up our view. We haven't created any views for our construction documents yet, so we don't need to worry too much about these dimensions. To delete a whole bunch of dimensions, we can grab our dimension tool, hold down the shift key on our keyboard, and click and drag a selection marquee across the whole project. And then we can press the delete key on our keyboard to delete all these dimensions. You'll notice that this change cannot be made with our auto refresh dimensions turned on. So when we delete these, it's going to turn off the auto refresh. And I'm okay with that, so I'll say yes. So we have a clean project without any dimensions. And we're going to put a deck on the back, and then we'll put a front porch on the side here. So on our toolbar at the top, we have our railing tools. We're going to go to our straight deck railing. And I'm just going to click and drag and draw a room out on this back side here. We're going to turn on our temporary dimensions so that we can get these into place. I'll select this railing and we can see our full distance here. If I want a distance for how much of an inward step this railing goes, we're actually going to use our end-to-end -end dimension tool again. So we'll grab our dimension tool, grab our end-to-end -to -end dimension. I'll zoom in a little bit closer here so I can see my snap points. And I'll just click and drag to draw that dimension. Use the move edit handle in the middle here to pull it out. And now we have our dimension. You'll notice when I mouse over this dimension, I don't get that pointing hand. And that's because I have the dimension selected and not the railing. So I'll go ahead and switch over to my select objects tool. Click on this railing and then click on this dimension. And we'll do a one foot inward step from that side. We'll come over to this side here. And once again, we'll do that end to end dimension again. Select it and move it up. Grab my Select Objects tool, click on the railing, click on the dimension, type in the value I want. The railing moved because I had the railing selected. And then I'll select this railing here, use my temporary dimension, it'll be an 8 foot deck. When we use a deck railing, if I select this room and I open up the specification for it, you can see that we have a deck room type already applied. And you can see that that deck room is going to have planks and joists, and it's going to have posts and beams to support it. I'll click OK on that. And then let's go ahead and put a porch in on this side. Now, depending upon what you want your porch to look like, we might choose a railing or we might choose a room divider. I'll go back to my railing tools. If I choose straight deck railing, it's going to give us planks and joists. If we use just a straight railing, we'll get a floor structure, and then we can call it a porch, which will give us a slab. So I'll use my straight railing. We'll click and drag from here, and we'll click and drag here so that we have a lovely little room here. Switch to my Select Objects tool, 
click in the middle of the room, click on Open Object, and we're going to specify this as a porch. You can see that it's swapped to a different, you know, four-inch slab here, so I'll click OK. Now we can specify these railings as well to be a different style. So we're going to group select these two railings. So I clicked on one, held down shift, click on the other, click on open object. And on our rail style panel, we can choose how this is going to display. If we want it to be a post to beam, so it supports a roof over it, we can choose that. We can choose open and we get rid of the balusters. And then to get rid of our horizontal railings, we can uncheck include top rail and uncheck include bottom rail. Now you'll notice that these newel posts are a little bit narrow for supporting a beam up at the top here. So we're going to go over to the newels and balusters panel. And we have the width here. If we do 3.5, that'll give us some 4x4 posts. Now the spacing in between it is what this value here is for. So it's 96 inches on center. So if it's 96 inches or less, it'll change our honor center spacing here. We're going to make it quite large because I only want to post on each end here. So we're going to change this to 180 inches instead. If you press the tab key on your keyboard, the preview will update for us. Click OK. Now let's go ahead and get some dimensions on here as well. So this is going to be 14 foot 2. And this way is going to be 8 feet again. Okay, let's take a camera view and see what this looks like. So we'll go to our camera tools. And then we're going to choose Perspective Full Overview. We can see our front porch. If we scroll around, we can see our back deck. But what we are missing is our terrain. So to create our terrain, we're going to go to the Terrain menu, and then we're going to click on Create Terrain Perimeter. That will create a lot that has our grass applied to it. If we want to select the terrain while we're still in the camera view, we can switch to our Select Objects arrow, click on our terrain, and then click on Open Object. This will open the terrain specification, and we can see that Auto Rebuild Terrain is turned on. That means if we add any elevation data, the terrain will update for us. You can see we have settings for our building pad. So the subfloor height above terrain, we have it set to automatic. And depending upon the type of foundation you have, it might adjust this value here. If you need to specify a specific value, though, we can just uncheck automatic, and then we can specify how high we want our subfloor above our terrain. So this is going to be the subfloor of floor 1. So if we needed to raise it, we would increase this number. If we needed to lower the subfloor in regards to the terrain, we would lower it here. I'll leave it as automatic for right now, though. So we'll go ahead and click OK. And we have our terrain in our camera view here. And if we go back into our plan view and zoom out a little bit, you can see that we have our terrain perimeter around our project here as well. This is just a polyline, so if we wanted to increase or decrease the size of it or dimension it, we can do that. But right now, I'm not too worried about the dimensions of the terrain, so we're going to just add some stairs for our porch and our deck. All right, so we'll grab our stair tools. And one function that we haven't covered about stairs yet is whenever there's a change in platform, be it from a porch to the terrain or from a sunken living room, the Draw Stair Tools has a function where if we click just on the outside edge of a railing, it'll detect that lower platform. We could click on the edge of a railing or on an edge of a, a wall or room divider. It'll detect the change in the platform, and it'll put stairs there for us that span that distance. So if I go back to our camera view here, you can see our stairs. All right, so if we wanted to make these stairs concrete, we can select them. If you right-click on it, you can click on it. You can get our contextual menu here, or you can use the Select Objects arrow. Click on it once and use your Edit toolbar. We'll open Object. Go to the Style, and we'll choose uh, Open Rises. We'll turn that off. And open underneath, we'll turn that off, and you can see it closes it off here. We'll go to the Materials panel, and we can group select these guys here. Select the material, and I'm just going to find a concrete. Okay. 
Alright, so now we have a concrete. Now you notice that this concrete is different than this one, so we can use our material eyedropper to pick up this material instead, and then we can apply it to these stairs. Like so. Now you'll notice, if we want to go back to rotating this, we can grab our move camera with mouse tool and use the mouse orbit camera to rotate around. But you can notice that uh, our porch is kind of floating, so we'll need to give that some support there. Now let's go back to our plan view. And if we go down to our foundation level, we can see our porch being referenced using that reference display that we still have turned on here. Since we turned off the auto rebuild foundation, the program did not automatically build support for that porch for us. It just created a, a slab for that porch. So we're going to go to our wall tools, grab our straight foundation wall, and we're just going to click and drag along these lines here to get our foundation walls placed in. If we select that wall and we use the arrow keys, um, we can see that we can align these walls with the wall above it. So we can align our concrete walls with the, the railings that we have above. So I'll click on align with wall above, grab this, and I'm just going to arrow it over until they start to align, and then I'll use the align with wall above, and I'll just tuck that corner in there. If I switch back to our overview, you can see that our porch slab is now supported by those foundation walls, and then we have our concrete stairs going down. Alright, let's go back to our floor plan view and we'll go up back to our first floor. Our railings got separated, so I'll just pull that together. There we go. Alright, if I wanted to make sure that these stairs are centered on my door, I can hit the space bar to let go of our straight foundation wall tool. Click on our staircase, use our center object tool, and we can just center it on that front door. Let's move on to roofs next. So if I look at my perspective full overview and we zoom out a little bit, you can see that we have our roof and it's been following along as we've been making changes. So whenever working with roofs, I find it very useful to be able to look at my roof in 3D as well as 2D at the same time. So if you grab the tab at the top for your camera, you can actually tile these views manually. And if you have another monitor, you can actually throw this up on another monitor and that makes it a lot easier as well. Since we're just working with the one monitor today though, we're going to toggle off our active layer display options, our project browser, and our library browser, just to give us a bit more room. And let's take a look here. So right now, we're on the first floor. I'll go up a level here, and we're back up on our second floor. And we'll turn off our reference display, and we're going to turn on our roof planes. So we'll turn our active layer display options on for a moment, search for roof, find our roof planes layer, and we'll just turn that back on. If you remember, we turned that off earlier. Once we have that on, I'll toggle this off again so that we can get more space on our screen here. All right, so we can see our roof planes. And we could manually modify these, but for the most part, using the automatic roof builder is going to be the more efficient way. So to manipulate the roofs, the first thing we're going to do is take a look at what's in our build roof dialog. So if we go into either build, and then we can go to roof and build roof here, or we can go to our roof tools parent on our toolbar, and then click on build roof here. This will open up our build roof dialog. And our build roof dialog is pretty much our roof default. So whatever we have specified in here, this is going to govern how our roof is going to build. Right now you can see that auto rebuild roofs is turned on. That's turned on by default when you first start a plan. Our pitch in 12 is currently 8 and 12. We have 18 inch overhangs and we're not currently using trusses. If you're going to use trusses, I recommend checking this pretty early on, but for this project, we're just going to use rafters, so I'm not going to worry about that. All right, so let's go ahead and change this to a 12 and 12 pitch instead of an 8 and 12. That'll give us a, a steeper roof line here, and we'll just accept what we have for right now. We're going to come in and make some changes later, though. I'll click OK, and you can notice with the auto rebuild roofs turned on, all of my roof planes change to a 12 and 12 pitch. Now, if we want to make some gables, we can do that fairly easily. We'll be in our plan view, switch to our wall tool or to our select objects arrow, click on one of the walls, and on your edit toolbar at the bottom of the screen, we have a toggle for gable walls. 
If we click on that, it'll change that wall to a gable end. If we click on it again, it'll switch it back to a hip. So I'll go ahead and gable that one, and I'll gable this one. And you can notice that our porch roof is sitting much lower than the roofs up here. And that's because there is no space on the second floor to tell that roof to generate higher. So for example, if we're in plan view and we turn on our reference display, if we grab our straight exterior wall tool and we click and drag and we draw these walls here, you'll see that that pops right back up. We'll align this wall below. That one's already aligned, it looks like. Since we set our default exterior wall to a pony wall, we're actually seeing that here. If we group select these two walls and open object, go to the wall types panel, uncheck pony wall, we'll get just our, our siding walls there again. Once we have a room on the second floor, it will recognize that it needs to put a roof over it and it raises our roof up. Now for this particular project, it's going to be a story and a half project. So this roof is actually going to be sitting much lower on this project here. So we're going to go back into our build roof dialog and we can choose the option to ignore the top floor. This means that it'll take the roof rafters and it's going to have them resting on the first floor plates. So let me show you what that looks like. I'll click OK and it'll bring it all the way down. You'll notice that our gables went away and that's because the roof directives were in the walls on the second floor, that top floor. Now our roofs are bearing on the first floor walls and not the second floor walls, so it's actually ignoring the directives that are in the second floor walls in favor of the directives that are in the first floor walls. So in plan view, if we go down, we can click on this wall here. I switch to my select objects arrow and click on this wall. We can gable this end, we can gable this end, and we can gable this, and we'll have a nested gable here. Now you'll notice that we have a bit of a gap right there, and that's because our wall doesn't go all the way over into that same area there. So back in plan view, up to our second floor here, you can see that this is where our gable is bearing right here. And this wall, just this wall here, doesn't go all the way across to fill in that gap. So we're going to grab this wall and I'm just going to pull it across. Now you'll see that we have a bit of an artifact there and that's because this wall is the prominent wall that's going all the way through. In reality, this wall should be the prominent wall. So we're going to grab this, we'll grab our break tool and we're just going to put a break right here. And then we're going to grab this wall and we're going to stretch it across one more time so that that wall is the prominent wall. All right, now as we mentioned, the roof is bearing on the plates of the first floor. If I go into my orthographic view tools here, you're going to find your cross section tool. And I'm just going to click and drag a cross section on this edge here. And you can see where our roof is coming down is actually sitting on the plates of our first floor. And in reality, we need a bit more space for the floor joists of our second floor here. So we actually need to raise the roof up a bit so that it sits on top of those floor joists instead of on the plates of the first wall. So I'll move this over here. We'll go back into our build roof dialog. And we have ignore top floor selected, but we also have this raise and lower from ceiling height. We have our floor structure and then we have our finishes and such there. And depending upon how you want to have your rafters, you might raise this up maybe 12 inches, maybe 15. If you want a bit of a, a stub wall that you want the rafter sitting on instead of right on top of the joists, then you might add a bit more. Um, in this instance, we're going to type in 15 and 5 eighths inches. Our auto rebuild roofs are still on, so it's going to automatically change. And now we're above that, and we have room here for a couple of plates for those rafters to sit on now. All right, I'll go ahead and close out of that cross section. And now we can see our story and a half condition taking form here. I want to have this roof ridge line go all the way across, and I want to have another gable along this edge here. However, if I go back to plan view and go down to my first floor, and I select this wall, this wall goes the entire distance to the front of my garage, which means I will end up with a very large gable going from the start to the end of this whole side wall. When in reality, if I want to maintain this ridge line going all the way across, I want that gable to end about here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on my break tool 
I'm going to mouse my cursor over the same area here. The roof is going to be getting its information from this edge of the wall here. So I'm just going to grab that. And I'm not clicking. I'm just dragging my mouse cursor over. And that dotted line that you're seeing, that's an extension snap. So I'm just going to pull straight over from there. And I'm going to break the wall right there. And then this section of the wall, I'm going to make a gable while I'm remaining this portion of the wall as a hit. So you can see that my ridge line is collinear all the way across there. And my gable doesn't come all the way up to the front. It stops right in line where it would go if this roof came all the way across instead of having this reverse gable come back in. OK, so let's take a look at dormers next. So we'll turn off our reference display. We're going to go up to our second floor. And we're going to create some dormers. So there's two styles of automatic dormers within Chief Architect. And we can find them by going to our Roof Tools parent. And then you'll find Auto Floating Dormer and Auto Dormer. So let's start with the Auto Floating Dormer. This dormer is a more of a decorative dormer that's going to sit on the rafters. So to use it, we're going to click on the Auto Floating Dormer tool. And then we'll just move our cursor right into the area where we want the front of the dormer to be. And then let's take a look at that. We'll grab our camera tool. We'll use a full camera. We'll go inside the room here, and we'll just take a look. So you can see this is our floating dormer. It's sitting on top of the rafters. It doesn't come all the way down to the floor. And if we go back to our plan view and we select that dormer, we'll grab our Select Objects tool, click on the dormer, click on Open Object. We can control a little bit. So we have the roof style that's going to be on the top of the dormer, the pitch of that roof. If we go to the Walls panel, we can specify how tall the walls are going to be. We'll just leave the defaults for right now, but keep in mind that you can control those. And let's take a look at our automatic dormer next. So the auto dormer is a structural dormer. It's going to require some more work from us. This style of dormer is actually going to tie in to another wall. So the first thing that we need to do is create a wall. And we'll put a wall here. And this is going to be kind of an attic space area. So go back to our roof tools, grab our auto dormer. And we're going to click inside this little attic space area so that we can place this dormer. Now if I switch my camera around so where we can look through the other side, you can see that this dormer actually ties in with the ground and actually notches into that attic space. So that's the, the difference between our floating dormer and our auto dormer is that it has these walls that it ties into, you know, kind of increasing the, the footprint of that room. Let's move on to adding some furniture. So let's go down to our first floor. And we're going to go ahead and turn off our roofs and our dormers here. So we'll open up our active layer display options. We're going to search for roof. And we're going to turn off our roof planes layer. And these are actually the openings within the roof. So I'll turn off the roof openings layer. Now we have a, a cleaner view that we can start using to uh, do some interior design work. Let's add a living room area here. I'll zoom in. I'm just using the scroll wheel on my mouse to zoom in and zoom out. And I need to add some doorways to this room. So I'll grab my door tools, go to doorway, and I'll just place a doorway in each of these locations. And then we'll go ahead and close out of our active layer display options. And let's open up our library browser. In the library browser, we can find a variety of different objects. You know, we can either search by keyword or we can go through the folders here and find what we're looking for. So in the core catalogs, if we go to the interiors folder, you'll find furniture. Or if you have something in specific that you're looking for, you can just run a search. We can see a few different options here. So we'll go ahead and choose that one. I'll place it here. And let's go ahead and grab some end tables. If you see something that looks like what you want, but you're wanting to see more variety, if you select the item in the search, and if you right click on it, you'll see an option to show in browser. And that'll take you to the folder that that object is located within, and you can see all the others that are similar to it. I'll just click and place a couple of these. All right, and maybe we'll do a rug as well. Now, when you're searching for rugs, 
we have materials that are rugs and then we have objects that are rugs. So this is an object here. And you can tell because it has previews that can be rotated here. Whereas these are just materials that are applied. Right now the preview is a teapot. So we're going to find an object for a rug. So like this medium area rug, we can start with that. And I'll click to place it and then we apply one of these materials to it afterwards. So we don't see any materials in our plan view. So let's take our camera view. We'll do a full camera. We'll just go inside this room looking at our living room set here. We can see that we have our objects. And then if we go through this list, we can find a rug material that we like. And we'll just use the material painter. When you click on a material in the library, when you move your cursor into a camera view, your cursor will be a spray cam. And that's an indicator that you're in the material painter mode. So if I click on this rug, it'll take my material from the library and it'll apply it to that rug. So if you like that, or we can go look through a couple of different rugs, you know, whatever makes sense for our project here. And let's go ahead and change the material of that couch as well. So we probably don't want a rug material. Maybe we want leather. So we have several different leather materials here. And we can spray paint it onto our couch. Now, one thing that you'll want to keep in mind when using the material painter is that we have scoping modes. So this first mode is component mode. So let's take a look at this couch here. If I select it and I open up the specification for it, if I go to our materials panel, you can see that this couch has two materials. It has a metal frame and then it has our leather fabric here. So when we're in component mode of the material painter, it'll paint one or either of those components. So we have leather number three if we wanted to, or we can do a colored leather, black leather, and it'll paint that component. So next we have object mode. Now object mode allows us to paint all components of an object that are already the same material. So for example, if we had leather feet as well as leather fabric for the upholstery. When we're in object mode, it would paint both sets of components. In room mode, it'll replace all instances of the first material with the second material throughout the entire room. So for example, if I wanted a robin egg blue for my walls, in component or object mode, it'll only paint a single wall, whereas in room mode, it'll paint the entire room. If we were in floor mode, it'll replace the material throughout the entire level of the floor plan. And then we have plan mode, which will replace all instances of that material with the new, new material throughout the entire project. Now you'll notice right now I have a paint roller instead of the spray can, and that's this blend colors with materials tool. And that's a toggle that can be on and off. So if I have a solid color selected from my library and I paint something that has a texture to it, so it has these, this is a, a pattern on here. If I click on this rug, it's going to replace that and paint it a solid color when I don't have that blend turned on. So I'm going to hit undo and let's turn on that blend color with material and I'll click on that rug again. And now you can see I still have the zigzag pattern of the rug, but now I have kind of a, a robin egg wash over it. So I'll hit undo again here. Okay, so let's go ahead and close out of this. And let's talk about some cabinets. Let's move on to our kitchen. Now, whenever I'm working in a kitchen, I like to switch to the kitchen and bath saved plan view. So, so far we've only been working in the working plan view, and this is where we can turn things on and off as necessary. But I like switching to the kitchen and bath floor plan view whenever I'm working in the kitchen because it kind of reorganizes things in a way that makes more sense for this sort of task. You'll notice when I switch to the kitchen and bath view, it turns off certain layers. It turned off the layers of my walls. It turned off the fill of my walls. It turned on our automatic kitchen and bath dimensions. If you were to open up a new plan from the interiors template, it starts you out in the kitchen and bath plan view automatically. All right, so let's play some cabinets. On our toolbar at the top of the screen, we're going to click on our cabinet tools. 
we can see that we have a base cabinet, wall cabinet, full height cabinet right in front here. So I'll grab my base cabinet tool. And whenever I'm creating a kitchen, the first thing I ask myself is, do I have any corner cabinets? And I place the corner cabinets first because they take up some room. So right now I have just a base cabinet. And if I click, it'll place a base cabinet. But I'm going to start with the corner cabinets um, because they do take a little bit of room. So I'll move my cursor into the corner, and if I just stop here, it's going to give me just a square cabinet. But if I move my cursor further into the corner, it's going to give me a corner cabinet. Once I get the feedback, I'll go ahead and click, and I'll see a full cabinet there. So let me do that one more time. I'll hit undo, and let me take a camera view just so you can see it happening. All right, so if we grab our cabinet tool, we have our base cabinet. We'll move our cursor into the corner, and we still have just a square base cabinet. But if we move it further into the corner, it'll give us a corner cabinet. And when I click, I'll get a corner cabinet versus just a square cabinet. So let's go ahead and place a few more cabinets here and make some changes. All right, so I've placed my base cabinets, and let's put in a full height cabinet pantry over on this area. Hit my space bar, and we're just gonna move this door over. I'll make this a nice big 48 inch cabinet here. We'll put in a doorway on this side as well. We select the doorway, we can grab these edit handles to move them, or we can op open object on these, and we can specify the exact width in here. All right, so we have that. Let's put in some more base cabinets to create an island. So we'll grab our base cabinet tool, and we'll go ahead and just place a couple of base cabinets in the middle here. And depending upon what you're wanting to do with it, you might make a couple bigger for a range. And then I'll group select these. Now, when you place a cabinet, you'll see this little triangle added. This tells you which way the cabinet is facing. So these are all facing outward. So I'm going to group select these and we're going to rotate these so they're facing inward. We'll just reduce these down a little bit. All right. Now whenever you're placing fixtures, we can do so out of the library. So we're going to put in a sink here. So I'll run a search for sink. We have several different sinks. Now you can also just go into the library browser and in the architectural folder, you're going to find plumbing fixtures. And in the plumbing fixtures, you're going to find sinks. So we'll have our kitchen sinks and I'll grab an undermount. So I'll expand this list here and find one that I like. So I like this offset one, so we'll use that. I just click on the cabinet that I want it to go into, and it's going to place it in there, and it's going to modify the cabinet in a few different ways. So I'll also hit my spacebar to let go of that sync tool, click on my cabinet, and I'll open it up. You can see if I use my rotate here, the sink put a hole in my countertop automatically, and this sink has fixtures. There are some sinks that don't have the faucets attached. Now one thing that I might do is I might increase the size of this drawer face or change how the doors look. And all that can be done within this dialog here. This is okay for right now. Back in that architectural folder, we have our appliances folder. Now, if you know exactly what you're looking for, you can run a search for a cooktop, for example, or we can go into the architectural folder appliances and find cooktops in here. We'll grab this electric cooktop and I'll place it here. We'll run a search for a hood. There are several different hoods in the core catalogs. There's also a lot of items available for download on our website. I'll use this arc hood and we'll place it just right over the top of that cooktop there. All right, so let's say that there's, you're trying to find something that we don't have in the core catalogs. How do we get more content? So within the library browser, at the bottom of it, you're gonna find this tool called Get Additional Content Online. If you click on that, it'll take you to our website, to our 3D library, where you can download additional catalogs. You can also find that by going into the library menu and then clicking Get Additional Content Online. All right, so we have some base cabinets here. Let's grab our wall cabinet tool, 
And let's place a wall cabinet up here. We'll just resize that and we'll place some more. And once again, once we move our cursor into the corner, we'll get a corner cabinet. All right. And let's go into our library and find a refrigerator. All right, and you'll notice as we've been adding these, we've been getting some dimensions. So we have our center line dimension on our refrigerator. And if we wanted to add a breakfast bar onto this island, we can do that with our countertop tools or with more cabinets. So if I go to my cabinet tool, you're going to find a, you can find a custom countertop tool. And then we can click and drag a rectangle to create a custom countertop. And we'll just line these up. And now we have a lovely little breakfast bar. Let's talk a little bit about customizing these cabinets. I'm going to start with a floor overview. So we can see down into our project. And we can see this small cabinet here. Let's make this a trash pullout. To do that, we're going to select that cabinet. So we'll switch to our Select Objects tool. We'll click on that cabinet and let's open up the specification. So we can see our cabinet here. And we want this to be just one drawer. So we're going to go to our front sides and back panel, which we can click on here, or we can click on the preview, and that'll take us to our front sides and back panel as well. So you can see that we have a drawer and we have a door. So I'm going to delete this door using the delete button here on the right hand side. That turns it into an opening and then we'll delete it one more time and that gets rid of that extra section. So now we just have a drawer with a couple of separations. We can move this handle up to the top. So let's go to the door and drawer panel. And you can see the door handle here, but this is a drawer, so we're gonna go down to the drawer handles. So we have a horizontal position and we have a vertical position. The horizontal is used default, which means it's going to be centered, which is what we want. But the vertical doesn't need to be centered because we'd have to bend over in order to open up that pullout. So we're going to specify a specific distance from the top. Let's do three inches. And if I press the tab key on my keyboard, that'll update our preview without closing out of the dialog. So that looks like an okay location, so I'll click okay. All right, and let's do a set of drawers for this cabinet here. So I'll select it and we'll open object. And we can select and open up the cabinets in plan view or in camera view, that part doesn't matter. All right, so we're in our base cabinet specification again. And I'm gonna click on the set of double doors here. That'll take us to the front sides and back panel. So we have our drawer up at the top already, but we also have these double doors here. So first thing I'm going to do is change this into one big drawer. So the item type is listed here. We can use this drop down and we're going to switch this to a drawer. And you can see that we have a few other items in here, so keep an eye out for that. But we're going to choose drawer. And now we're going to split this drawer into two. All right, so we have this drawer selected and then we have a split horizontal option here. So that'll split it horizontally and now we have three drawers. You can specify the height of each one of these drawers using the item height value here. If you want all three drawers to be of equal height, then we can use the equalize button. The key to using the equalize is that we need to be on the parent item of the drawers. So these three drawers are all listed underneath this one vertical layout parent. So we'll click on that parent and then we'll click on equalize. So now all three of our drawers are of equal height. Now, in some instances, that might not happen, especially if you've been modifying the item heights individually. When you change the item height here, what happens is we have this lock from auto resize checkbox that automatically checks. Whenever you make a manual modification here, it assumes that that's what you want to keep and it will lock it from being automatically resized. Let me make this a five inch drawer. 
And then if I go to the vertical layout parent and I hit that equalize, it's going to equalize these two. But this one is locked from auto resize, so it's going to stay at the 5 inches. I'll uncheck that, grab my vertical layout parent, and then I'll equalize one more time. And now we have an equal in height tree drawer bank. I'll click OK. While we're in this view, we can see that our windows are a little bit too far down and they are intruding into where the cabinets are located. So we're going to use our mouse orbit just to see our windows a little bit easier. And then if we use our Select Objects tool, we can group select these windows. And we can open object. And we can specify a floor to bottom value. So we know that our cabinets are 36 inches high. And we probably want to have a little bit of extra space above that. So let's do a floor to bottom of 40 inches. Now we have our window sill above our countertop. I'll close out of this camera and let's move on to creating an electrical plan. So right now we're in our kitchen and bath plan view, so I'm going to switch this to our electrical plan view. It will turn off our kitchen and bath dimensions. And let's see about placing some electrical. On our toolbar at the top we have this outlet, which is our electrical tools parent. We'll click on that. You can see that we have tools for outlets, lights, switches, and we can connect our electrical with that, connect electrical tool. Let's start by placing our lights. Now the light tool is a multi-purpose tool. If we place a light inside the room without touching a wall, it will place a recessed can light. If we move our cursor towards the edge of the wall, we can see that we get a sconce. If we're on the inside of a, a structure, it'll give us an interior sconce. If we stick it on the outside, we're going to get an exterior sconce. So depending upon where you click, you'll get a different sort of light. I'll go ahead and place some lights here. And if you watch the extension snap, you can make sure that we're staying in alignment. So I'll go ahead and place a few more here. All right, and then we'll put some lights over our sink and our cabinets. And let's place some switches next. So we'll grab our switch tool, and let's put a light switch here, and I'll put a light switch over here. And then we'll use Connect Electrical to connect these switches to our light fixtures. So I'm just clicking and dragging to connect our light fixtures. All right, turn off temporary dimensions. And then we'll do one last connection to this switch. And you'll notice once it connected, it gives us a three-way switch. I'll zoom in here. Let's do that one more time. As soon as we connect a second switch to our circuit, the switch will change to a three-way switch. And to avoid confusion, we can grab and reorganize these circuits. Like so. Let's place another switch over here and then we'll connect these can lights here. Let's go ahead and take a look inside this kitchen now. We'll grab our full camera again Click and drag to be able to see inside of our space. So you can see our switches. We have our can lights up there. We have our switch there. Looks like we need a bit more room in that area. And then we have a switch here. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to framing. We'll switch to our framing floor plan view. You can see that we have some dimensions already in here. We might choose to turn those off. But that's okay for right now. We're going to actually go down to the foundation level. And you can see the framing for our deck is already generated. That's because decks automatically regenerate their framing for us. So what we're going to work on next is going to be floor framing. 
So we'll go into our build menu, we'll go to framing, and we'll choose build framing. Or we can use the framing parent tool here and go to build framing. We can choose to automatically build the floor and ceiling framing, which is what I'll choose. Otherwise, we could just put a check mark in the build floor framing checkbox for the subfloor of floor one if you wanted to do it floor by floor. On this dialog, you can see that our floor structure is currently 12 and 5 eighths inches. You'll notice that it has a checkbox that says default. That means that it's getting its information from a default setting. If we click on edit, we can specify something away from the default settings, or we can go into our defaults, which is this white wrench again, and go to the framing defaults to specify what the structure is for the floor structure. We can see that our joists are 16 inches on center, and we have a two and a half inch joist width. We can choose rim joist widths as well as blocking and how our joists are going to bear over beams and walls. So it's set to lap currently, and that's okay for what we're looking for. So we have automatically build floor and ceiling framing, and I'll go ahead and click OK. And you can see that we have our framing. Now, you'll want to notice that we're getting framing going vertically. One thing that we'll need to do is we specified the upper wall as a bearing wall. So we can see this here, the supports are being lapping over this wall. We want to do the same thing on the lower level. So down on the basement level, we're going to grab this foundation wall that we drew in. We know that we have the foundation wall selected because if you look at the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, it says foundation wall. And I'll click on open object, go to the structure panel, and we'll go ahead and choose bearing wall for this wall. And when I click OK, since we have the auto regenerate floor and ceiling framing turned on, it automatically updated and reoriented those floor joists. Now, the program is going to always try to run the floor joists across the shortest span. So when it wasn't recognizing this wall as a bearing wall, the shortest span was vertically. But now that we have this bearing wall in here, the shortest span is going to be horizontal instead. All right, so let's take a look over here. We can see that this is a pretty long span, and depending upon you know, what sort of lumber you're using, this might be too long of a span for the joists. So we're going to put in a bearing beam here. So in our framing tools, you're going to find a bearing line, but that is just a CAD line that behaves like a beam or a bearing wall. We actually want a beam because we want a, a three-dimensional object that shows that uh, pressure point. So we'll go over to our floor and ceiling framing tools, and you'll find a floor slash ceiling beam. So we'll click on that, and we're going to run a beam from the edge of the garage slab here across that basement level area. So you can see our beam here. We can make sure that it's pocketed into our concrete if we need to be that detailed. And you can see that we're lapping our floor joists over that beam. Let's take a look at our wall framing next. I'll go up a level here. And let's go ahead and take a look at our framing defaults again. So we'll go back to our build framing. And we're going to go to wall. And right now, automatically build wall framing is turned off. So let's go ahead and turn that on. Our default stud thickness is one and a half inches. The default stud spacing is 16 inches on center. And the stud depth is determined by the wall layer, which means if we have a six inch wall, we're gonna have two by sixes inside that wall. Our interior walls have two by fours in them. We can specify our top plates, the bottom plates here. If we go over to openings, we can specify some span tables for our openings. So those are the doors and windows. And, but let's go ahead and click OK on this. So you can see our studs generating in there. If we want to get a detailed view, we can click on one of these walls. And on our edit toolbar at the bottom of the screen, we have an open wall detail button. If I click on that, it'll give us a wall detail of the framing of that wall. So you can see our areas where we have our big windows. And this is the double door to our kitchen. I'll close out of that. All right, let's go ahead and build some roof framing. So we'll go back to our framing tools, build framing. We'll go to our roof. You can see our structure is nine and a quarter inches. If I look at that, you can see that's just for framing. So we have nine and a quarter inch rafters. We can specify our fascia boards, subfascia boards, ridges, all using this table here. We'll go ahead and set automatically build roof framing and I'll click OK. 
And then we'll switch over to our framing roof plan view. And you can see that our joist layers turn off and our roof rafters layers turn on. And you can see our framing areas for our dormers there. If we go into either our orthographic views or our perspective views, you'll see an option for a perspective framing overview or orthographic framing overview. If we click on that, we can see a, the stick build of our structure so far. All right, so we'll go ahead and close out of that. Now that we have our structure kind of put together, let's look at sending views over to a layout. To open a new layout, we're going to go to File, and then we'll choose New Layout. The Layout page is a two-dimensional space that allows you to organize views of your project. So everything that we've been doing so far back in the plan file is the three-dimensional model. The layout, being a two-dimensional space, doesn't have the same architectural tools, and you'll notice that our toolbar is much diminished compared to what we have in our plan view. Each layout can have multiple pages, but the important page is going to be page zero. Page zero is our page template, which means anything that's on page zero will be replicated on every single page going forward. So we can see that we have these borders, we have some tables here, we have dates, we have titles. Anything that's on page zero will be replicated on every page. So you want to be particular about the type of information that you want on every single page. This might include your company name and address, your phone number. We recommend taking the time to customize your layout with your information importing in your company logo and saving that as a layout template. That way you don't have to redo that information each time. But for this project, uh, we have page zero, which is our page template. We'll go to page one. This is going to be the first page of our construction documents. So if we go back to our floor plan, let's go ahead and take a perspective full overview. And let's put this on our front page of our layout. We'll click our Send to Layout button. And when we do that, we will choose what layout we're going to send to. So we're going to send this to our new layout. It'll go to page number one. We have the option for current screen or current screen as image. Current screen means that it'll give you anything that you have on the screen there. Current screen as image will take that information and will create a static image of it. Below that, we have the option for live view, update always, or update on demand. Update always means that as we're making changes to our project, the layout will stay in sync and will update automatically for us. Update on demand means that the layout won't update until we hit the refresh button or right before we print. Depending upon the size of the project, you might choose update on demand if it's a larger project, because the update always does take some resources. I'll click OK. And this will send it to our page one of our layout. Since this is a camera view, we can reshape it using our edit handles. If we want to resize it, we can hold down the X key on our keyboard before we click and drag that corner. If we zoom in, the resolution will get tighter and tighter as we go. So right before our, we print, it's going to update all that information for us and you won't see these jagged edges that you're seeing right now. All right, let's go back to our floor plan. Now let's take an exterior elevation. So we have our cross-section elevation tool. Now, depending upon where you want this camera to show up, we might switch back to our floor plan view shell. We'll grab our cross-section elevation tool, click outside the project, and click and drag towards the project. And this is going to create an exterior elevation for us that we can then send to our layout. We'll hit our Send to Layout button again. We're going to send this to page number two instead. We can choose Entire Plan View, Current Screen, or Current Screen as Image, Live View Update on Demand. We also have the option for plot lines in this view. The difference between the live view and the plot lines is that plot lines will actually plot some CAD lines onto your layout, whereas the live view will be a dynamic portal back to your project. 
Down at the bottom, you can see we have our scale specified here, and then I'll click OK. We can grab this view and move it around to wherever makes sense for our project. Once we send a view over, it is saved and we can close it out. And let's go ahead and send our floor plan view over as well. So we'll hit our send to layout. We'll choose entire plan view. Let's send this to page number three. Once again, we have our scaled view here. And I'll click OK. And here is our floor plan on page number three. Let's send a, a view of our kitchen over. So I'll scoot this over here. We'll go back to our floor plan. Let's switch to our kitchen and bath plan view. Zoom in closer. Make sure we get our dimensions in there. And then we'll do a send to layout. And we'll do current screen. That way we don't have to have the whole plan in our view. You can do a quarter inch scale or a half inch scale, whatever will fit on your page. We'll send it to page three as well, so we'll leave it at the quarter inch scale and see what it looks like. Okay, so it's a bit small. That's all right. We don't need to have the dining room area in there. Now, since we sent this view over at a quarter inch scale and we want to make it bigger, we can use the rescale layout view button here and change our quarter inch scale to half inch scale. And now we have our kitchen and bath plan view there. I'll move this up and over a little bit and let's send that view again, but this time let's send over our electrical view. Back to our plan view here, switch to our electrical view. And we'll send this to layout as well. We'll do current screen, page three, and since we already know, this should fit at a half inch scale. And I'll click OK. Bring this over. And let's tighten this up. There we go. Thank you for attending our Chief Architect Bootcamp webinar. We try to provide as many resources as possible for you to learn and become more proficient with our programs, whether that's using the built-in help, additional training videos, or our knowledge base articles. If you'd like to dig in deeper to this project, you go to the Help menu. You can view the tutorial guide. This boot camp is loosely based upon the content that is in that tutorial guide. But however you learn, we want to help you be successful using our software. Beyond the free training options I've mentioned, we have several other opportunities to learn more about Chief Architect, which include free and paid webinars, as well as on-demand classes and one-on-one -on -one personal training. If you have yet to purchase a copy of Chief Architect, feel free to download the trial version available on our website. And thanks again for attending Chief Architect Bootcamp webinar and have a great rest of your day.